Okay. So to start off with, would you like to say your name and where you are? Uh, Eric Worthman, um, uh, outside of Woodstock, New York. I realize this sounds like the beginning of a police interrogation or something. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the first question is, who are you as a human being? And that can be anything you'd like to share about yourself in terms of passions or qualities or values. Oh, dear. Well, by and large, I've been with, I kind of started out as a political uh, community organizer, tenant organizer, actually. Um, and so I've been involved in organizing around progressive politics um, since I got out of college. Um, I, you know, I had a dream that I would be a novelist. Um, and I was an American literature major, literature major actually. Um, and I went to a college that had a lot of famous writers. I had American literature with Ralph Ellison who wrote Invisible Man. And, um, uh, a lot of poets. Um, but I, uh, I had a lot of actually learning disabilities. I was really dyslexic. Um, so in some ways it was a, fantasy to be a novelist, even though Ralph Ellison had read an early story and said there was some kind of raw talent, but it really had to be worked over. And I didn't have that kind of um, patience uh, to be able to do it. Um, so in some ways I kind of had a, my, the sixties were not great for me. I, I was went down to the Lower East Side. I had a number of odd jobs market research was one, but also being a waiter was another and so forth and so on. Uh, and then I met a person who became my wife who's um, also down the Lower East Side. And then we got involved in the, in the late sixties movement. I, I had been involved in the early sixties and then I decided to drop out for a while because I came from that background and I thought, you know, I'm just following the background. Um, but I can't say I did anything interesting for the three or four years. Uh, and then I got back involved. Um, and I organized, I joined a, a reading group with eight or nine ex priests and three or four ex nuns. Um, it was um, started by a guy named Stanley Aronowitz, who became a big social. He was a union organizer in his youth, but he became a big sociologist and, and there was a lot more, like 11 or 12 books. I think he became the head of the critical theory department at CCNY or um, SUNY. Anyway, he called me and said, oh, wait a minute. I, I, no, I, I guess before that, no, maybe that's right. That's, that's where I started. Um, so we, it was a reading group. That was a big thing in the 60s. You know, uh, we all had reading groups um, about whatever issues there were. And we did one on the city. And then it was decided that we would organize, we would work on the subway system to make it free. And so I was organizing, uh, it's called Strap Hackers United. There's one now, but that wasn't the one that we had. And, uh, we got a break. Um, uh, there was no news that day and we had sued we i can't remember why we got on the front page of the daily news but we did and we got a call from two young lawyers um one of them was pretty became pretty he was african-american but he and he had a he died in a car crash i think in, in africa which was awful and then Cliff Glenn was the other one, and she went on to become an is right now a judge in the Brooklyn court system. Um, they had an idea about suing the subway system and called us, so we sued. And then uh, there was an attempt to raise the fare, and we decided to organize around that by having people all over the city in subway stations and have people jump over the turnstile. And much to our surprise, it was a huge success. 
um, it didn't last very long, but we went to court and there was a trial and all stuff. So, but that got me back really into it. And then um, when the Chicago seven trial took place, I had known Dave Gelber, who was the editor of Liberation Magazine. That was the magazine that Dave Dellinger had started with Paul Goodman. Um, and because Dave was in the trial um, and everybody was really at loose ends, uh, he asked me to come on, even though I had no magazine work at all. And I worked and Dave, then they got off after going to jail for three weeks. And um, so Dave came back and I, I worked with Dellinger a bit, actually. We did a week of driving around the East trying to sell a magazine before his lectures. And I would pass out the magazine. And it was actually, it was a real experience. It's like in Wilmington, which is really a Southern town. It was very clear that no one would, would be allowed to put that magazine up on the rack. It was all very subtle. I had been through that. I had been in Mississippi in the early 60s, um, not in the Freedom Riders, but with a group called the Poor People's Corporation. Um, so I had been down there for about three weeks, about 63 or four, maybe five, 65, I think I was down there. It was with uh, Abraham Maslow's daughter, Ellen Maslow. Um, anyway, uh, out of that, yeah, some of the ex-priests, um, one of them got involved in a clinic in Brooklyn. And he had an idea that we would bring some progressives out and under the guise of this hospital clinic, we would create a kind of alternate space. And uh, I went on, my wife came with me. Um, she got interested in it. And that's actually how I got uh, I was out there for almost 10 years. I became, he went off to fight in Nicaragua. The staff voted me to be the director, even though I had no degree. This was only happened in the 60s. It would only have happened in the 60s and the hospital agreed with it. So um, I did that work. We were out in the community uh, working with high school students and had rap groups and other groups and stuff. And then more and more, we, we, we my wife actually got a supervisor from uh, Downstate Medical Center in Kings County to come out to help us run the groups. And my wife, Cindy, uh, my, my daughter-in-law was Cindy Sheldon, who had started the, the San Francisco Gestalt Institute. Oh, well, Cindy was the one who called me to tell you. Know, so I knew about Gestalt, not that much, but I knew about it. Um, I wasn't crazy politically about Paul Goodman. We had had a bad moment with him at Liberation. So I had, I had read Growing Up Absurd when I was a kid. Everybody read it when they were in high school. Well, everybody, I, I read it, I had read it. Um, and I think I had read one of his novels, I think Making Do. And I had read a couple of the essays, but we, he was really could be a pain. Um, and it was very disruptive that day. Anyway, some of the staff that we hired, social work staff, were at the Gestalt Institute. Carl Hodges was one, a woman named Hondai Dela Cruz was another. And I felt there were two things that were happening. One was, I realized that I wasn't gonna stay here forever. I was going to have to have some kind of degree here if I, and I was getting more and more involved in doing individual psychotherapy. Um, my wife actually pioneered with Hunter College. She went down to get to see if we could all go to MSW schools and they loved our program. So basically the whole staff took, we took, we took turns, we chose. You and I would go and then Next year, they would start and we would finish. And eventually, there were a couple of people already had, had MSWs. Uh, Ellen Maslow was also in, and someone we picked to come on with me. And so she was also there. Um, so I began to feel like at, after nine years, I was ready to, I also had children now, and I was ready to see if I could do a private practice. And I had heard about Richard Kitzler from a number of the people on our staff who were working with him. Uh, Carl Hodges was one, Charles Mizwinski was another. Um, 
That's someone you should talk to, by the way. Uh, have you, has the name come up? It has, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, and I met Richard at Charlie's wedding. And because I had looked around for a supervisor and the two of us hit it off immediately. And I knew that this was the one. So I went, I, I worked with him as a supervisor therapist. I mean, with Richard, it was all kind of the same. Um, and I didn't go to meetings for a couple of years. And then finally I decided I would go. And then I go, I went and I got involved in it more. And Richard had suggested I study with Laura, as I told you last time. And so I went to study with Laura, then I wound up studying with Isidore Fromm. Um, but I always stayed with Richard pretty much all the way through. So and, this, is, um, this is sort of like the, the routing through to Gestalt, but you're, I'm, I'm curious about certain things about you that made Gestalt make sense for you. Um, and I mean, I, I getting the sense of, you know, the, the activism and the work and those kinds of things, but I'm wondering, you know, what would you name as some of those qualities about yourself? Well, in let, let me let, there was one theoretical concept that I really liked that had to do with very closely with me, which was creative adjustment. Okay. As someone who was very dyslexic, I mean, I, I really was barely got through college. And the dean of my high school had said to me that I was the worst learning disability they had had up until that time. My father was the head of the music department. I think it's the only reason they, they kept me in there. Hmm. Um, Gestalt, it, first of all, it was working with the body and it was also even though psychoanalysis is not really an intellectual experience. By the way, I had gone into therapy with, a, with an analyst uh, for two and a half years before. I can't remember when that was in this whole sequence, but um, there was something about the idea of creative adjustment to one's early experience that really made sense to me. And, that, and then Richard really worked on that part of it in the therapy. Um, and that did appeal that, that somehow when I looked over my life that it all made that made help me make sense of some of the things that going on. Because I was, you know, um, I, I there had been always a dream about being a filmmaker and psychologically I was not I was just not prepared to go into it. I do have one fantasy thought that if I had been with Laura at the very beginning, that she might have been able to direct me into that in that direction. Um, but I, it, it had to do with someone I sent to her and how that she dealt with that person much later. And um, but that may just be a fantasy on my part. Uh, so. I don't know what to say about this. I mean, I, I did like working with people a lot. Mm -hmm. And I certainly liked, I, I did like the action also of the, of the, the large demonstrations or the medium demonstrations. Um, you know, the Vietnam demonstrations, uh, the whole thing. Um, and I did like the people I met in it. Um, I also liked the people I met at the Gestalt Institute, even though there was a lot of they were all very individualistic and they, uh, there was a lot of, um, there could be conflict a lot, but I liked them all individually. Um, so I don't know how else to answer it. So um, about yourself, I'm wondering what you would name as some particular values that you hold in your life or in your work. Well, I, I, I do try to be empathetic to where people are. And I'm not just talking about clients. Mm -hmm. I always had this particular, um, I think I was very sensitive to people's pain. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because of things that I had gone through. I mean, Richard used to say I was exquisitely attention to, to people's pain, including his, <laughs> which is one of the reasons why I think we, you know, we connected. Um, uh, so, and I did have a very strong, within that empathy, a very strong feeling about fairness and, and social justice for people. Um, I did also believe that art was a transcendent experience that people allowed themselves to get into it. Mm -hmm. uh, this came up recently with, um, I read the New York Review of Books and this young guy has just done a two part review, one part with Malcolm and one part with Martin Luther King. And he's just written a book about Martin Luther King. I think he's at Harvard, but I just read an interview with him. He grew up in Baltimore and um, uh, he had an interesting journey, but he then said at the end that he felt that he grew up with one of his uncles who was gay, uh, believe, gave him the experience of art as a transcendent experience, both in music and uh, novels and in painting pictures. And I always attracted to that uh, right from the beginning. There were certain works of art that really seized me. And um, this is the, it's a cliche when people say, I saw this and it changed my life, or I read this and it changed my life. Um, but there were a number of books. The Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man was very powerful to me. And then much later, Robert Musial, uh, Musial is not that well known here. He wrote a three part novel called The Man Without Qualities, uh, which is one of the great novels of the 20th century. Third part has just been retranslated. Um, and then in film, uh, I, I was lucky in the late 50s was the new way, the French new wave came in and Antonioni and Fellini and the Italians were then pushed into the foreground. Um, seeing Michelangelo's La Ventura was a real turning point. Um, I had gone on a February vacation. I was in college. Um, Bard had a, the college I went to had a three month off period, which was really a mistake in terms of trying to get jobs in June. But, um, so I had gone to see it and, uh, the, the two things, the thing that everybody wrote about was that the, the woman that the film started out with disappears. I don't know, have you ever seen this? Well, this is something, it's all on Criterion, so it would be, um, and breaking all the screenwriting rules, she never comes back. She disappears and then two people, friends of hers who then fall kind of in love, go searching for her. That's the adventure. But what Antonioni brought to the whole thing was the way in which he shot buildings, architecture, streets, um, and how modern architecture kind of dwarfed individual people. So when I left the theater that night, I remember it was up on, God, I forgot, now I finally forgot the name. It was up in the 60s on Second Avenue. I came out at 1130 at night because it was about a two and a half hour movie. And looking out at the, the buildings and the few cabs that were going in the street, the few people walking the street, I was looking at it in a way that I had never seen it before. And then I walked across town because my subway was over on the west side and that took me up to close to Yonkers where I was born. And, um, and also, the, it was a real hit among college students who liked it. A lot of people thought it was slow and boring. Um, but the question that was asked is how come this woman disappeared? And in my opinion, she disappeared because the institutions that were there to support her could not support her at this time. And Antonioni who was a real intellectual I really, I think, knew that. Um, it, it was one of the works that really, uh, um, what's the word, not previewed, but when you guess something's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, 
for for something for it, it, it predicted the 60s mm -hmm. i mean paul goodman to his credit did that too there were a couple of writers in america paul goodman norman mailer also did it and one of paul goodman's <laughs> I, I like C. Wright Mills because my father, brother was a sociologist and I really like C. Wright Mills, but Goodman and Mills hated each other. Um, and, and Mills could be horrible. He didn't like homosexuals and he really was terrible, you know, talked about Goodman in terrible ways. But The Power Elite was, a, was an important book when I was a kid. Um, but Antonioni did that too. And then he went on to become Antonioni. He's one of the great film directors of all time. He made a trilogy of films. La Note and then have finished with Eclipse. All of this you should see. Um, <laughs> and then he made a, well, all this on Criterion, he made a film called Red Desert, the first color film, mm -hmm. in which he worked for six months in the lab to suggest the psychological trauma of the woman character. So the color was not realistic color. It was color that suggested her mood. Uh, it's incredible to watch. It's a, it's not it's very it's not one of his best films in the end dramatically, but it's really something that uh, as a therapist it's really fascinating. Um, so that those works of art really influenced me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, they told me in some way more about the world than anything else that I read or seen. And then when I see the world. <laughs> I used to see the reverse. Andre Malraux talked about this, that you, you see the world reflected in the artworks you read. It's like he, one of his posits in the Voices of Silence is that artists don't become artists by looking at the world. They become artists by looking at other artwork and they get turned on by the artwork. And then they start making the art about the world that they're in. Um, and I think that that's right. I think he, he was right about that. So is this, I mean, not only creative adaptation, but the creative process part of what grabbed your interest in Gestalt? No. No? What, it what may is it be. I mean, I have to think about it. I hadn't thought about it that way. Because mm -hmm. um, I've noticed a lot of, you know, dancers, theater people. Um, yeah, they're into it. Yeah, they, they um, see that connection right away. So I'm, I'm wondering. But you know, I meet Jungians. My wife's more of a Jungian. Okay. They also have that artistic background. And right. some of the analysts I knew. Yeah, but what about you? All wanted to be novelists. <laughs> um, uh, what about you? You were working with, with Richard Kitzler, with Laura Pearls. Mm -hmm. And what, what were you finding, or what did you find in Gestalt that kept you interested? I guess what I felt, there was a freedom in Gestalt that I didn't really experience when I was working with the analyst. Um, this idea of making your own interpretation, which actually is a very tricky thing because we all grew up with Freud's interpretations and then other people's interpretations. So to try to move that, you, you, get, you kind of keep that here while you're trying to keep yourself clear here. Um, and I really tried as a therapist never to make any judgments. And but they would ask me questions like, what do I do with clients? What do I do? And I would really try never to answer those questions. You know, try to get them to get to a point where they could make that decision. Uh, and there was a freedom in that. Um, and there was a, there was a freedom that came out of Gestalt reading and more not the reading, but the, the people who were involved in it and the conferences and groups, because one of the things people used to say is because so many people did not come from an academic background. There wasn't that much writing in the early days. Now there's a lot of writing, but there wasn't there in the early days, there were a couple of readers. There was Fritz's book, even Laura had terrible writing, you know, and her essays don't really do her justice. Um, uh, so in some ways, the lack of writing freed up the therapist to be more improvisatory in, in many ways. Uh, 
So that, and I think that's one of the things that attracted me to it. And how did getting involved with Gestalt training and theory and practice, how did that affect you as a person? What was the impact of Gestalt on your life, on yourself? Well, I, I actually think I answered it, that the, the idea of creative adjustment gave me, I had natural empathy anyway. And the idea of creative adjustment gave me a certain empathy toward what people did. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it, in political, you know, I can be very empathetic with people burning down the Pentagon and that doesn't go over very well, but, but I, I understand what's going on. Uh, I don't like it, but I understand what's going on. Um, uh, and I felt it, 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 wind up, it, it, it wound up making me looser as a person in terms of things. I was very careful when I was younger about what I would say. People used to complain that I could get people to talk about themselves, but I never talked about myself. And I think that that was probably true. And now I can, I can do it um, more than I used to. Uh, and again, Richard was very good about all this. Um, because as you probably surmised by now, Richard was a bit of a madman himself. And um, I've heard some stories. <laughs> uh, and the madness part I could really relate to. And he was very good at capturing some of my madness. So, because, hmm. uh, you know, he was terrific with certain people. For other people, they couldn't stand him. Okay. Um, What yeah, we'll tell that story. But okay. <laughs> okay. I mean, I was going to ask, it looked like you went somewhere, you know, was there a particular moment that was coming to mind? What do you mean, right now? Yeah, <laughs> it looked like you just went Well, somewhere. I was going to, there was one, I had a funeral I told, I mean, the um, memorial service, I told a particular story it told me that was kind of stunning to a lot of people. No. Dole was the only one I think who would have heard it who got it. Um, yeah, if it doesn't feel appropriate, that's fine. We can just leave it. Well, it. I mean, I, I'm more curious, but in asking that, I'm what I'm curious about is what are some of the moments in your Gestalt experience that stay with you? And I mean, that's where some people remember themselves as a therapist, themselves in a client. You know, just some of those experiences that stay and change you somehow? Well, I actually think it's more about when I was with Richard, Laura, and Isidore and some of the, a couple of conferences. Um, I can remember a couple of key moments with clients. Um, I mean, here's an example. I, Margarita loved this when I told this at one of the, uh, there was a, Richard's birthday party, and she came in. There was a, uh, it was all a dinner at one of the armories. Um, I had a very, a, a very interesting disturbed patient. Um, I guess she, you know, she would say she was a borderline, uh, and she called me and said, "Eric, uh, I'm sitting in my apartment, and the window is calling me to jump." Out. And I had never had, I had one at the very beginning, I had a young teenager said they were going to commit suicide, but I knew they weren't. But I had to talk them through it and so forth and so on. But I really didn't know quite what to do here. And so here is, you know, there's a God, I guess, because I called Richard and he answered the phone. And he said, do this. Um, work with them to jump out the window. And she was on the sixth story and to go, you go one story and then look in the window. And what do you, what do you experience? And the next story, what do you experience? What, what story until you hit the ground? And what it did was it grounded her. She was floating and now she was grounded. It was a brilliant um, experiment. 
Margarita loved it. She never forgot that. Um, and I always forgot, I always remembered that because one, the experiment itself, but also working with the supervisor to help the client, it was a trio, you know, it was a, it was a group activity. And that was, that, I always thought that was terrific. Mm -hmm. um, and now I've lost the question. I, I can't remember where we are here. Uh, uh, just asking to see what popped up as some of the memories about Gestalt that have stayed with you. Yeah. And, I mean, another part of that would be because it, you've mentioned, you know, your work in the clinic and some of the other projects that you've had. I'm wondering what challenges you have run up against in Gestalt. I mean, that's the client that worked well, but have there been contexts or experiences that you have found more difficult or frustrating? This is something you probably want to cut out. It, it, it had to do more. There was a lot of conflict in the Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, Isidore and Richard each had their groups and there was also conflict with a number of the people. Um, and sometimes I found that kind of wearing, to be honest with you. Um, it kind of drained me. You know, I don't know if I would cut that part out because I think it's important that, I mean, Gestalt trips on its own feet so often. And I mean, any organization, any... Well, any uh, what I've discovered, it, every political organization trips on its yeah. own. Um, and these were very strong personalities uh, who were involved. Uh, but I found it, you know, kind of exhausting after a while. Um, I, I can think of a number of clients, um, but most of the clients, well, I can give you a mistake. That this is something. <laughs> I was now in about my 15th or 16th year, and I thought, oh God, I got this down, this is great. And this guy came in uh, who had been beaten by his father periodically. And then as I was listening to this, I, I had this kind of recognition that this probably went on until maybe he was a teenager. And then he beat up his father. Hmm. And I said that. Because I thought it was so hot, you know, to say, uh, I, did you beat up your father? And he got very stiff and said, well, yes, I did. And I said, well, we, you know, we, we should go into this. He never came back. And I think I, of course, had jumped the gun. I should let, uh, it would have been much more beneficial if I had let him say it when he felt ready to say it. But I thought I was such a hot shot to figure it out that he had beaten up his father. Um, and I, I never forgot that one. Uh, yeah. So that, that was a lesson. <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, everybody's kind of waiting for that point in their therapeutic career when we get out of the not knowing, but the not knowing never ends. We're never supposed to be the one who knows it. First. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and many times after you've been working with fifteen and twenty years, you do know it first. You just but have then the catch is you got to hold it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a good reflection, right? Uh, yeah. Because you, this, you know, you see so many clients, and certain things begin to reappear over and over again. Yeah, the patterns—they're beautiful. Patterns, yeah. They're all different. Yeah. And yeah, you know, everybody is different, so. So you, you said, you know, we can see if we take it out or not, if it's still here, it's here. But you talked about the conflicts in, in the New York Institute as tiring for you, right? So do eventually, you- Eventually, exhausting eventually, yeah. Yeah. Do you or did you feel part of a Gestalt community in any sense? 
Was there yeah, <laughs> well, the larger community, I, that, in, in terms of New York, there were, there were a number of five, six, seven, eight people that I really felt very close to. And you know, mm -hmm. when we go to conferences, those are the people I would sit with. They would mm -hmm. sit with me. We would go to hear each other, hear them talk on some of the things. And I felt very close to them. Um, Luella, Dan Bloom, Carl Hodges, Karen uh, Humphrey. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting some, but there are about three or four more. Mm -hmm. um, so what does being part of a Gestalt community mean to you? What does that phrase even mean? Acceptance. That's what I meant. Hmm. I, I did feel accepted there. And of the people I'm talking about, they did, I think they understood me. And I understood them to as much as we possibly could. So yeah, I felt that there was an acceptance there of, of who I was and my accepting who they were. Um, that's what it meant to me. In terms of the larger experience, um, I knew individuals. I knew Lynn Jacobs. We, we would go have coffee every time she'd come through New York and Gary. Um, well, okay. And then um, when we went to Italy, I, the, the New York Institute pioneered this thing that Margarita asked uh, the New York Institute to come over. I went over to the first two. Uh, Dan wasn't there that first time, I don't think. Rue was there. And I realized that her group, they all had PhDs, a lot of them in philosophy and stuff, and they really were very sharp. Um, and I felt like our group wasn't quite as, as, as knowledgeable, whether they were good therapists or not, I don't know, because that doesn't always go together. But there was, um, um, there was an intelligence that was really powerful. The second one was in Syracuse. It's actually, you'll, you'll have to see this movie, but Antonioni shot the famous opening part in um, the islands off of Syracuse, uh, off of um, uh, Sicily. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, God, I can't remember anything anymore. Um, they're like six or seven. And um, it, to show you how famous it became, when we got there, there's a tour that says this is the Antonioni Island <laughs> of the rock that the famous scene where the girl jumps off the, the, to go swimming um, and then comes back and then they go on this little rock off part of the island and then she, they don't know what happens to her. Um, so you could take a motorboat out and I swam where she swam and so forth and so on. That shows you how famous it was. Um, uh, and that particular, that really brought a lot of people from, and it wasn't just the American Institute, the New York Institute. It was, there were a lot of people from Europe there. And, um, and it was a great, that was a great meeting. And that was a lot of fun. Um, so but I, I, I don't know if I felt a part of it. Uh, I mean, I did feel a part of it, but I never really saw those people ever again. Yeah, that's funny. It's sort of like one night stands in a lot of these conferences and well, three nights experiences, stands. two, three, five night stands, yeah. and then everybody's back to their own country, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wish it was like one night stand, but <laughs> that's a whole other issue. Yeah. So I, I skipped a couple questions about yourself at the beginning. And and I am wondering um, sort of where you are at this moment in your life in terms of how you're understanding your or experiencing rather your age and you know what you're doing and what you would like to be doing next well you're asking a loaded question i'm going to be 80 in april um, i read the new york times every day and i read the obituary section first and I open it up and I see the age of the people. Even before I look at who it is, I go immediately to the second paragraph. They were 76, they were 83. Then I look to see what they died of. Now, of course, with COVID, that's taking over, but it usually can't be. 
Um, and then I look to see who it was. Hmm. So I'm very aware about half the people who die are younger than I am. And then half the people are older. Um, and I'm very aware that I'm going to die soon. As Samuel Beckett said, I'm in the last act. And, um, you know, I would like to make one more movie. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I have a feeling I'm not going to be able to do it. It's a little too ambitious. Um, and I'm, I probably could not raise the money that would be necessary. I, I said I wouldn't go into making another movie unless we really had the act finances. Um, You know, there was places I wanted to see in the world. I've kind of let that go. Now with COVID, of course, that's really mm -hmm. almost making stuff really difficult. There are a few places. I did like traveling. And my wife and I always had good times when we traveled. Um, although she was at this moment feeling like it doesn't make that much difference to the way she traveled. Sorry, your voice is dropping off. I can... well, it might, well, it doesn't make that much difference to her whether she travels. She's more involved in the political work we're doing around climate change, and that for her is what, you know, that's mm -hmm. what's giving her power. She also runs workshops for women and so on. So, um, but I am realizing that I'm, I, I'm, uh, I'm going to die. And um, I have absolutely no. As Camus said, when you die, it's ashes, that's it. And I have no other belief in anything else. I mean, one of the reasons I'm attracted to climate change is because I think that in the end, there's us, individual people, and there's the environment, and that's it. Um, so even the spiritual, like when you go into the climate change politics, you run up against with the spiritual world. And I will say there has been one woman who I've met, Joanna Macy, who's a very famous older, she's in her 90s. She's an older activist all the way back into the 50s. Uh, she's written about five or six books. She's a Buddhist, uh, a Mayana Buddhist, and um, she is fantastic. And you can look her up on YouTube. Her interviews are great. Um, so that's been a big, she's been terrific to discover late in life. Uh, she also said to me once we had lunch in Berkeley and she said two years ago, you know, Eric, I realized that I'm going to die before the world I want will probably be in place. And I never thought about that before. Hmm. Um, she said that. Yeah. I, I was sure the world that I wanted would never be in place. So, <laughs> so horrible. But, um, and I don't, I don't think about death. But I think that I will be gone. Um, so that's what I do when I think about it. You know, I've been rereading all the books. I decided when COVID hit that I would reread, especially the novels of my youth. So I reread Kafka's The Trial, I reread Herman Brock's The Sleepwalkers, and I'm going back in the usual. I read Ellison's Invisible Man. Um, picked off a few things, and then I've just been reading the mass psychology, Wilhelm Reich's Mass Psychology of Fascism, mm -hmm. and I hadn't read that. I realized how much of it I didn't quite get. It's actually fascinating to read about it. what actually is apropos and what isn't, what feels old and what is ready. And that made me think I would like to read Foucault's introduction to sexuality. Um, when I pass 50, you know, when you get older, books don't, you don't have that moment that you had when I was a kid. And I'm going to turn the light on because I think I'm disappearing in darkness. Um, things don't change your life the way early novels or films do. Because mm -hmm. uh, then you're, now you're living. Before that took the place of living, now you're living. Um, but there were two or three books in the last 30 years, and one of them was Foucault's Introduction to Sexuality, Volume 1. I thought it was that. Um, and then the Chilean novelist Roberto Bolano, who 
um, died a couple of years ago. Uh, his novels really are amazing. And the two big ones, The Savage Detectives and 2066, where they're long, but there are short ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and he actually was obsessed with why, how could an artist be a fascist? In his, in his son, his novel. There's a novel called The Distant Star, which is only about 145 pages, uh, about a poet who publishes his poetry by skywriting, but he's a fascist. Uh, and it's really terrific. <laughs> so Bolano and, and Foucault, maybe a few other people, but the, it, it's, um, you don't have that moment that you had when you were younger. That's true. When you felt like, oh, this is changing my life. But Foucault did. Foucault really did. Oh, so, I don't know. Yeah. So I mean, this is this is where you are, and I'm wondering. I mean, you're you're telling me this as someone who went through the activism of the '60s, the '70s, the '80s, the '90s, blah blah blah. What do you think is next for Gestalt? What place does it have in the world that we're in right now and going forward? You know, I don't really know. I, I uh, one of my younger sons, one younger son had a rap group that moved around Brooklyn, and one of them has become a Gestalt therapist. He went through Gap, and I got to be careful here. But my one of my sons has seen a Gestalt therapist, has seen one, and said it's the best therapy he ever had. He asked me if I knew her, and I did know her. Um, she was very interesting. Uh, but I don't want I now I don't want to yeah so um so it's obviously still has an impact on clients um in some way the world caught up with it uh it, you know when it when it came out in the, the first book came out in 51 it was a real earth shaker um it's no longer an earth shaker anymore because a lot of the ideas have moved into the mainstream even into psychoanalysis even into mm -hmm. Jungian therapy and so forth, they all kind of mix together. I was beginning to wonder whether individual therapy, would it hold on um, as the world moves? And I, I still think it does. Um, a lot of the techniques in group therapy though, have entered into the mainstream in political groups. One of the, the, the optimistic signs of the the younger political groups is that they are all very attuned to how they work together. I mean, we, we have a group in Transition Town here in Woodstock in which one of the groups is a support group for people who have conflict with other people. And you come to the support group and have them work it out, help you work it out. And a lot of the um, Extinction Rebellion had this built into it also. So a lot of that kind of work, the, the, the realization that per, people's, someone said it's people's trauma, since everybody has so many about trauma in these groups, that the traumas get in the way of the political organizing. And so that they have to have these groups to, to kind of work through the trauma as they organize. And that's, I think, that's one of the results of therapy, actually, and especially group therapy. It's sunk into the culture. Um, I don't know about individual therapy. I'm, I'm sure people will continue to go. Um, you know, I guess, you know, here's another thing coming back to an earlier question. I, I thought the DSM 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 were terrible. <laughs> Not and, very good reason. And, literary. Well, it, it's more than that. Um, it, it, not really coherent in any way, but the Achilles heel in psychoanalysis, at least in America, was seeing homosexuality as a neurosis. And if you talk to some of the people in the Gestalt, one of the things about the Gestalt Institute is that they were the first institute to expect ex, to accept homosexuals because they they saw it as a creative adjustment. That was one of their you know that's why there were so many homosexuals in the New York Institute. One of the things I did discover when I went out to conferences is that, that a lot of the other institutes didn't, didn't have that many homosexuals in it, whereas New York had a lot of homosexuals. Um, so uh, 
the diagnosis itself, I find, I never really believed it. I didn't mind making some kind of general feeling about psychotic and sociopathic and neurotic. Nobody uses neurotic anymore anyway, anyway. but all these divisions I felt didn't really help anyone. And I'm not even sure they really help the therapists work with these clients. And I felt like um, uh, some of people's behavior, which was seen as neurotic, was not neurotic. It's not neurotic. It was healthy for them. Um, I guess, you know, the, the, when they talk about creative adjustment, they do the obsessive compulsive. For some people, obsessive compulsive character structure, that sounds like Reich, is healthy. It helps them move. For other people, it is unhealthy. It stops them from doing what they want to do. But for some people, it really helps them do what they want to do. Um, so I, you know, and that was one of the things finally, uh, Heather, filling out these forms, which especially when Prozac came in, Prozac was supposed to cure every single thing in the world. And so they would say five sessions, Prozac. And, you know, people would cheat on this. If I had a borderline, I'd never write that down. First of all, it wasn't anonymous, as they said. It wasn't kept private. In fact, that person I talked about who was the window was actually a public school teacher who was very good, an English teacher. Um, and they found out she was going to a therapist and the union found out. And that was all supposed to kept, um, you know, confidential. Yeah. And so then I learned, uh, I'm gonna put the least um, explosive Diagnosis down. I can't remember the one we all used. Some adjustment or something in there somewhere. Um, because I, I didn't believe it was confidential. Hmm. And then they would say, well, this isn't such a serious diagnosis. Five, you know, five sessions and get the program or whatever the, the current drug was. And then all the forms, you know, I've just finally felt like uh, I decided to throw in the towel. Mm -hmm. But there was, and there was other reasons for it too. So I, I had gotten back into politics um, with a group called the Pachamama Alliance, which was, I had gone to Ecuador with this group and lived in the rainforest. We had gone into the rainforest. And I saw that the oil companies were absolutely destroying the land. And then I felt like, I, we, we got to do something over there. This is going to change. So that led me there. I, I was really, I'm sitting with what you were saying about the way that the group awareness, and I know it's not just Gestalt, has, has come into other organizations. And I, I think that's really interesting. I mean, the way forward is probably not individual clinical therapy anyhow. Well, I don't know. I know that group therapy, I actually was in a group with my analyst. Mm -hmm. And that was actually more beneficial than his. He was good. I shouldn't say that, but the group experience was good. Um, and then, of course, Gestalt groups were a major part of Gestalt therapy. So, um, yeah, that the, the group, younger people seem to realize, at least in the progressive world, that these groups have split apart in the past. And so how can we try to make sure that we don't split apart and keep working? Um, I mean, there's still, you know, I hear complaints about dictatorial, people who are dictatorial. They're usually the ones who are more lucid. They can do the talking. Um, that seems to be a, you know, a continual difficulty all the way through. People are jealous of them, so forth and so on. Human nature. Yeah. Well, I, I'm wondering if there is anything at this particular point that you would like to add um, about yourself or any final thoughts on Gestalt from your perspective? I don't really have any thoughts about Gestalt from my perspective. I mean, I haven't, I went off the list. They put, I, I somehow I'm not on this list anymore. I used to read it. Some of it was really good. Other people I knew that I liked. Um, or when I say that, I met people who said, who wrote that was really stuff that was really interesting. Um, Peter Philipson in England and so forth. But um, somehow I'm not on it anymore. And I realize it's kind of a relief. 
uh, not to be on it and to read it because there's other things I'm reading. I don't really have anything uh, more to say about Gestalt and I don't really have anything more to say about myself. Um, you know, then it gets into things that the equivalent stories with Richard Kistler that I'm not saying. <laughs> <laughs> which I've said before, but I'm not sure I want it off on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. And actually, so, I, I want you to cut what I just said, actually. Okay, yeah, that's fine. That's fine. We'll find a good place to uh, to end it, and I will uh, send you the recording to have a look at. Is that okay? Send it when? I'll, I'll send it to you to preview if we stop this now. I'll just go quick. Okay, I mean, I won't be able